Welcome back 2021ers. This lecture will continue our discussion of programs and optimization of them, mainly tacking towards the micro optimizations category, which we defined with minor rigor last time. A few uh, logistics updates. Uh, Project 4 is out and I'll have a separate video that I'll release hopefully later tonight, but potentially tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, uh, to discuss uh, some aspects of that to survey it. Uh, but this lecture will be mainly focused on the contents uh, that we're attempting to teach and will be reflected in the project through the techniques that you learn in this discussion uh, to optimize code. Uh, we'll have a number of activities surrounding that, uh, including Homework 11, which has just been released, uh, and it surveys several kinds of micro-optimizations and compares them in ways to memory optimization uh, to see uh, if the access pattern uh, that's is being utilized in this call mins exercise is really more effective to optimize uh, than all of the loop unrolling and other techniques that we'll talk about later. And lab 12 will discuss use of macros as an optimization technique, although that will generally just touch on what the specific mechanics are associated with macros as compared to function calls. The two look alike and the exercise that will be illustrated in lab 12 is designed uh, just to get you acquainted with it and we'll touch on that more as as we move ahead in discussion of optimizations. Uh, the last sort of logistics thing that I want to mention is that uh, we may actually finish up on our lecture series on optimization by this Friday. And if that's the case, on Monday, I'll actually forge ahead and to start discussion of the next topic in the course, which is virtual memory. Uh, and, but that won't sort of disrupt our planned schedule that on Wednesday, we'll have a review and on Friday, an exam. And if we do get to discussing other topics on Monday, they won't feature prominently on the exam. That'll be more towards the final. And keep in mind that we're two weeks, uh, just under two weeks and counting uh, before project four is due. All right, we left off last time uh, having discussed a number of issues, and it's probably a good idea just to summarize a few key points at this uh, juncture. And uh, to that end, the quick review exercise that's represented on the slide, I think, is in order. Uh, the sort of discussion that we had earlier about optimization started with deciding when uh, should you optimize. And that also sort of went in line with uh, directing your efforts to be as smart as possible about that. So uh, discuss the following things with the neighbor or internally sort of resolve them for, you, for yourself before we move ahead that uh, ask what's the first thing to consider when optimization seems necessary. Uh, and second, what kinds of optimizations have the biggest impact on performance uh, so that you can direct your efforts accordingly. And finally, uh, we're discussing this issue of using micro optimizations, little code tweaks to uh, squeeze out more performance. What's the best way generally uh, to implement these that gets you the maximum benefit with the minimal amount of effort? Uh, this all is sort of in line with programmers as smart but lazy individuals. Uh, and so seeking to optimize your own efforts here is the thrust of these questions. So uh, contemplate those for just a minute and then we'll resume. All right, uh, so the answers that we discussed generally is that uh, first thing to consider when optimization seems like it might be necessary is is it really necessary? And always this is done in the back with the backdrop of there being limited time for you as a programmer to devote to different tasks. Oftentimes optimizing performance in one area really only needs to be done if it's deemed critical uh, and that there are always other tasks like debugging, improving robustness, adding features uh, that you must be weighed against that and often take precedence over it. Uh, the kinds of optimizations that will have big, the biggest impact tend to come in the sort of hierarchy that we discussed, but most importantly, selecting the best algorithms and data structures for the job uh, is essential uh, to getting good performance. Part of our project that we're engaging in right now explores that by comparing some of the classic data structures for a searching task of just looking for integers uh, that are stored in data structures and will illustrate in a real way some of those big O complexities that uh, are sort of theoretically predicted and whether they play out uh, in truth in, uh, uh, in those searching tasks. Uh, if you have searching tasks, then there's a whole wealth of data structures uh, that are designed to make a searching easier and faster. Uh, and to that end, you want to select one. Uh, generally, then, there are a bunch of other things that you want to do, like eliminating unneeded work, 
uh, optimizing the memory access patterns. Uh, some of these that will have play in the project. And it's only last that we would get to these micro optimizations as something that you may want to spend some time optimizing. Uh, and the best way to implement them generally is to let the compiler do it for you. Uh, so answers to these uh, come in the next uh, sort of slide and review some of the things that showed up in more detail earlier. Uh, we'll pick up with this last point, which came to the fore, in that the typical compiler, GCC included in this, has different optimizations that it can perform on your behalf. And generally, this dash capital O uh, set of options here dictates how much effort the compiler devotes to attempting to optimize the C source code that you would provide it into more efficient assembly. So to back up just a little bit, uh, we left off with the following discussion in which we had this code, a uh, sum range, uh, which looked uh, something like this and two versions of it. Uh, one that wrote repeatedly back to memory in the loop uh, and one that used a local variable, which was very likely a register uh, to total up that sum. We saw that with very minimal debug or uh, very minimal optimizations, this debug level optimizations, uh, hitting main memory in that sum range one did take considerably more time uh, on a large number of iterations uh, versus the sum range two, which used probably a register variable. But by Cranking up the optimization level just a little bit in the compiler, we get essentially identical performance between these two. And that's because the compiler will devote efforts to transforming this source code at optimization level one by applying various little tweaks to it uh, on your behalf and will essentially convert what was the sum range one algorithm here that hits main memory through a register dereference into what you'd expect the sum range two code to be, where in the innermost part of the loop here, uh, when you're adding things on, you don't actually hit main memory that the compiler is elected at this optimization level one uh, to devote a register to that instead and only writes back to main memory at one time. So uh, on that front, uh, this kind of optimization uh, that's done here on your behalf by the compiler is incredibly useful uh, and worth exploring a little bit. Uh, now, most of you will notice that uh, dash OG that's used up here versus dash O1, uh, these have a sort of, well, it's doing something behind the scenes. Uh, and it's worth talking about that explicitly uh, as compilers generally implement various kinds of transformations that they'll do on your um, uh, code and knowing about some of those is, is worthwhile. So this notion of dash OX uh, is usually associated with the number, although we've seen there's a G here to optimize the debugging performance. And they generally fall under the category of turning on more bells and whistles that the compiler can try in order to attempt to generate better code. So just your plain dash capital O or dash O1 turns on certain transformations that the compiler will apply to your code in, in order to increase speed. Uh, these tend to be relatively conservative. They won't make big changes to your code, but we've seen it will tweak things like, oh, was writing to main memory every time, will instead write to a register. Uh, and that can save you a lot of time in terms of execution with, uh, while saving your code from having to become uh, nigh unreadable uh, by hand tweaking those optimizations. Uh, turning on O2 will enable all of the optimization levels uh, that were used previously, uh, plus some more. Uh, and we'll see some sort of indication of this. Uh, and one of the things you should be uh, noting is that you start to sacrifice uh, some things here. Uh, and as you work your way up, uh, it's this O2 level that's typical uh, and doesn't involve much speed and space trade-offs. So memory won't be used uh, to implement uh, speed saving measures uh, that instead um, most of this stuff uh, doesn't use much more space either on the stack and almost never in the heap in compiler optimizations. O3 also tries more aggressive stuff. Uh, and OFAST is probably the ultimate extension of this where uh, the code that you have becomes somewhat non-portable as you run it, as in uh, turning on OFAST may get you slightly different results on different machines due to the lack of standards compliance um, as it implements things. This probably has more to do with uh, things like uh, undefined behavior in the C standard or performance associated with floating point numbers and things, uh, tricks that can be used there by the compiler to get things go faster. Uh, generally, you can expect going from O1 to O2 to O3 that you can potentially get more speed, but these things are discrete and certain kinds of programs see speed benefits uh, going from O1 to O2, whereas other kinds of programs won't. 
to give a more real sense of what we mean by turning on optimizations, uh, just turning on O level one, uh, we'll turn on the following tricks that the compiler will try. What you can think of then is uh, your code as some sort of a data structure uh, that the compiler constructs from the raw source text file that you provide, the .c file. Uh, and uh, one thing it can do is to take that raw data structure and output assembly based on it. Uh, or alternatively, if you have some optimizations enabled, before outputting assembly, you can try a transformation on that data structure, which will tweak things around according to this auto ink deck uh, in, uh, optimization. Uh, and this usually has to do potentially with internal instructions, for instance, in the Intel architecture set, uh, that has to do with um, the special instructions that automatically increment and decrement stuff. Uh, if it's not clear, I'm probably just bullshitting at this point that um, I have no idea if that's what it actually has to do with. Uh, but uh, this is uh, one sort of example of a tweak that a compiler can try, which may be available on some CPUs, may be available generally, but isn't always available. Um, there are various other things in here which you should by no means attempt to memorize. Uh, but you can see all of these are sort of discrete entities that the compiler might try to transform the data structure in some order. Uh, so what you'd expect is maybe I'll try this forward propagate thing, and then I'll try the auto ink deck, uh, and then I'll try uh, to shrink and wrap uh, separate and, and so forth. Uh, these options then are something you transform the data structure to uh, so that it looks a little bit different, and ultimately then the assembly code that you generate may be somewhat different. Some combination of the ones that are present up here are what leads the sum range one code to be transformed into something uh, that resembles sum range two code uh, and leads to the speed. You could try doing all these things by hand, but the strong suggestion is to write your code, uh, write it cleanly uh, and maintainably, and then let the compiler apply its many bells and whistles here. Uh, even at old level one, you can see there's uh, uh, quite a few of them that the compiler might try. Uh, let the compiler uh, try tweaking things uh, to get better performance. Generally, it's fairly good at looking at the transformation and predicting this is probably going to make a positive difference, and so we'll keep it. Or uh, as for transforming, this doesn't look good anymore. We'll backtrack uh, to try something else. So you think this is somewhat of a search process. Any one of these things you could try individually or in pairs or in trios, uh, but turning them all on at once gives a lot of potential change that can impact performance, usually in the positive way. So we'll discuss then um, things that the compiler can and cannot do on your behalf. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but with respect to our, our review question over here, uh, the second one, uh, all of these micro optimizations, things that the compiler can do, are generally stuff that you can tweak on the compile line. We'll talk about hand-coded versions of these and how they historically served an important purpose, but these days less so, and times when you might want to do those hand uh, versions. Uh, but generally, all the compiler can do, though, is at this last level, the micro-optimizations part. It's you as a programmer that will be responsible for making sure you're accessing memory in an effective pattern to utilize cache, uh, that you are only doing sort of the minimum amount of work in the CPU uh, that's needed to get the job done, that you've eliminated all the extraneous unneeded stuff, uh, and that you have ultimately selected algorithms and data structures that are appropriate to the task. Uh, very importantly, no compiler that I know of, and I think no compiler that has existed or will exist in the near future, can look at your linked list code and decide, you know, a binary search tree would be better in this case and transform it automatically there. That is yet a human decision, uh, and this is why we still have jobs in computer science. So uh, to that, and if you're curious about these things, the best place to go uh, to read about this kind of stuff is in the GCC manual page. And so as you would uh, over here, uh, jump over to a shell uh, and type in something like man uh, GCC, uh, what will pull up uh, is a manual page about it, uh, which has a lot of stuff in it, including things uh, like the languages it supports, uh, various warning options and stuff, uh, and then a long, long list of optimizations uh, that it can perform. All of these here are an individual option, for instance, uh, pass-fipa-pta. I don't think that has anything to do with imperial uh, pale ales, uh, or India pale ales for that matter, uh, but instead is some transformation uh, that the compiler might do to your code. Uh, you can see that list is relatively long. 
Uh, and so understanding all of them is probably not necessary. But if you wanted information uh, on a particular uh, 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 option and type just to know uh, for personal information, uh, you'd maybe punch in that, let's say auto uh, ink and deck, that's one what we saw earlier. And later on down here uh, will be a description of when this is turned on uh, for 01, uh, along with some more details about what exactly it does. Uh, combines increments or decrements of addresses with memory accesses. Uh, so this is use of special instructions that might be present on uh, a particular architecture. All of the uh, optimization options have an entry like this, uh, but to really understand what it's doing, you'd probably have to dive into the GCC source code and gain a whole lot of understanding about the data structures it uses and how those can be transformed uh, to enable performance uh, before you'd really get an understanding of where this thing uh, has its place. I don't suggest doing that in preparation for any exams and so forth, uh, but I do suggest uh, studying carefully what we're going to talk about next in terms of hand-coded optimizations uh, so that we, you are well prepared uh, to implement those in hand when we disable optimizations such in Project 4 so you can still eke out some more performance. All right, before we get to that though, I have a, a promised exercise uh, that has not so much to do with uh, the micro level optimizations, but harkens back to some of the earlier kinds of optimizations uh, that we discussed uh, and eking out better code performance. And to this, we actually have to turn away from C for the moment and go to a language that tries to do more for you. Uh, and in this case, that will be Java. Generally, as you move up the abstraction hierarchy away from assembly in C, programming environments attempt to do more on your behalf. And one of the things this can do is to induce some hidden costs associated with programs that aren't apparent immediately to the novice. This exercise is designed to get you thinking about it because it uses this little rep strings uh, function, uh, which exploits something that's present in Java and many other programming languages, uh, which is string concatenation. So the idea of this function is to return a string uh, and take as an argument a string called str and how many times you want that string repeated. Uh, you start out with an empty string and then just repeatedly add on to whatever this result is one instance of this little str string. I think an easy way to think of this is if the string str is just the single character a, uh, and then the reps here is five, what this uh, thing will do is to produce a string that is a, 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 as in five a's in a row, uh, that's the string that it will create. Uh, and if instead reps was 10, then you'd have 10 a's in a row. That's probably the easiest way to start uh, understanding this function, uh, although there are a lot of internal details that we'll actually need to address. But to get your head around this, uh, then give a big O estimate for the runtime of this function based on the code that you see. And keep in mind then, uh, big O estimates, uh, they're somewhat fraught, but uh, we weren't gonna lie here on that front. Uh, one thing that you may never have been exposed to is to give a big O estimate for the memory overhead with this function. As in, it needs to produce a result, and in the case of the string being one letter and the reps being five, you think of this as uh, uh, the memory uh, associated with the result here is gonna be order n, where n is whatever this reps is. Because I need to create a string uh, that is n long out uh, there with my single character. Uh, but there may be some memory consumed in the process here uh, used for temporary space uh, that uh, is not strictly necessarily if we go to get it. And this is what's known as the, the memory overhead or the memory consumption of this function while it's in action. So think on that just a little bit. Of any place you might see memory being used or thrown away and discarded. Take a moment, consider those two, uh, and get back to me. All right. Now, the reason that we're talking about this is uh, that uh, is, is what we'll see here is that there's a hidden cost to executing code that looks like this. Uh, you don't get this kind of problem in C because anytime you would have costs associated with memory, for instance, in C, you'll be doing all of the work. And it's instead at the higher level in Java, for instance, where Java is actually doing some things on your behalf, uh, but they have this cost associated with them that um, good programs should be aware of. And the central problem comes from this string concatenation operation. Something that you will hopefully have learned in a study of Java is that strings themselves, like this result uh, up here, are actually immutable. Uh, they can't be changed. 
And so the string referred to by this result is empty, uh, contains no characters, and will always uh, be empty. When I affect a line like this, what I'm actually doing is creating a new string and pointing result at it. So this plus business over here is actually a concatenation operation, which will allocate memory and combine the current results uh, with whatever stir is, and then assign this new string back to the variable result uh, to point it there. Uh, meanwhile, the earlier string, uh, which was empty, is going to be discarded. Uh, this process repeats in a loop, and I think is best represented if you actually set up a little uh, memory diagram for this thing uh, and have a look at how it goes. So to that end, I have prepared uh, the beginnings of such a diagram over here. Uh, let's have a look at it quick. Uh, in the stack up here in the upper left, I have the stack variables associated with that code. Uh, let me take the slide here uh, and move it to one side so that we can see that bit of code as we execute it. Uh, you'll see here uh, throughout this uh, routine, I have this little rep guy and uh, my stir. Let me move those up top so that they look more like uh, the arguments of the function. Uh, and then I have this results uh, that's here. Whoops, uh, shoot, let me just uh, undo that. Uh, paste you here and yeah, okay. Uh, results here uh, that's assigned initially to an empty string and an I which starts out at zero. Uh, so my initial string here, uh, which I'm gonna place at memory just 1048, uh, that's down here uh, in the heap and that's where Java, like many other languages, allocates its objects and so forth. Uh, and so we'll keep uh, an idea down here of results that's referring to 1048. It's an instance of a string. And right now it has a length of zero and a sort of data part of it uh, as an empty string. This is, becomes a little bit disingenuous because if I were actually going to draw this heap diagram properly, this would be a pointer to another heap location wherein there'd be an array of characters. That gets just a little bit messy, so I'm not going to bother with it for the moment. Um, up here we have also a string uh, It's referred uh, from the, uh, the stack, 1024. That's the string uh, that I'm passing in. And as I indicated before, we're just going to treat that as a one letter string, uh, the string A. So it has a length of one and a uh, sort of character content of just A. So if I start executing this code and get to the sort of opening of the for loop, the I gets initialized to a zero. And then I start doing this uh, sort of adding of strings business, otherwise known as concatenation. The first thing you have to resolve is, what's the result of adding result and stir here? To that, you have to know the semantic meaning, which is uh, to make a new string. That's the combination of first characters from results and second characters from stir. The way that Java will do this is to allocate some more memory. Uh, so I'd put that maybe a 10... Uh, let's see, 64 for instance. Uh, this isn't referenced by anything, but it will be soon. Uh, it's an instance of string, which will have a length uh, and a data here. And I can actually calculate the length early on for this uh, because it's a combination of the characters coming from results and result currently has zero characters. Uh, and it's uh, the other characters that are come in here are from stir and stir over here, it has a length of one. So I know my total length is the sum of those two. It's just one right now. And then proceed to copy characters here. Uh, as in, I'll copy zero characters uh, from results and one character from uh, this stir string right here, uh, leaving me with uh, a total of A here. Uh, we'll see why uh, in, in a minute, but I'll, in order to construct this thing, um, I'll uh, give myself one more little column over here to say I only copied uh, one character into this thing in order to create it. Finally then, with that string created on the right-hand side of this, I'll assign the result over to uh, the left-hand side here. Uh, so to that end, uh, the result variable is going to track that. And I'll describe that here by saying result now points here. Uh, this one it doesn't have anything referring to it. And I'll also modify up here, this now points to 1064. All right, so far so good. That is one iteration of this loop and it sort of underscores there was actually quite a bit of work done here. There was an allocation of memory. There was a copying from two different spots uh, in here and then an assignment back to the result over here of what the uh, resulting thing is. Uh, let's carry this on and uh, do another iteration here. Uh, so at I equals one then, uh, the next iteration of this, I'll do the same thing. Uh, but importantly now, uh, results actually refers to a different string. Uh, so the allocation here to create this left hand side thing, I have to find more space for this. Uh, suppose I'm up to uh, memory address uh, 1100 here now. This is the memory allocator having to find space for this stuff. 
uh, not uh, referred to by anything, but is a string of a length and a data here. Uh, to calculate the length here, I need to take whatever result is uh, right now. It's presently here at 1064, uh, and it has one character. So it'll be a one here plus whatever string is, that's a one there. So this will be a total of two characters uh, for that. Uh, and we'll copy in whatever the result is, that's an A. Uh, and then whatever stir has right now, that's at 1024, that's also an A. Uh, so an A here. Uh, and that means I'll have copied two characters uh, uh, total in that from. Uh, that gets me through to the one iteration of this. Uh, so I increments up to two. And you can see where this is headed. Uh, oh, finally, then I have to assign results is uh, now pointing down here to 1100. And I'll do that in uh, two spots. Uh, this is going to get uh, dull if I continue on at that rate, but generally you can expect the following pattern uh, to happen. Uh, that's here. I'll need to uh, get another copy of this thing. For convenience, I'll put it at 1200. Uh, this will have a length of three and be the string AAA, involve uh, three characters being copied. Uh, the next one uh, will be at 1300. Uh, that'll be for I of two. Let's see, I, I'm, I've lost track now. So I'm gonna need five total. So yeah, so I think we'll be at I of four at this point. Uh, so that'll be uh, length of four, copy another A in. Uh, I get four here, so yeah, four here, and then another A in here. And then finally, my last copy of this uh, at memory address 1400, uh, which will finally be referred to uh, by this. Let's see, get rid of these results. Maybe this one, uh, length of five total uh, with an A over here with five characters copied. Uh, that'll tick me up to five, leave this thing pointing at 1400. And I think that's my final state over here. Now there are a couple of things that we've sort of elided here, but eventually I can return memory address 1400 as my result and I have my list of five things here. Uh, but we've made one sort of assumption here is that um, the memory that I'm allocating along this way, it sits around at least for a while. Uh, this is maybe a typical sort of behavior for a garbage collected language like Java, where it will allocate things uh, and not bother recouping this stuff until later where a garbage collection phase happens. Uh, now, if the garbage collector is very aggressive, maybe uh, on the, this one sort of string going out of um, scope, uh, then I will make use of the similar area uh, for the next instance so I won't build the heap up quite in this way. But this is sort of a worst case scenario. You can see by the time I've finished, I've left all kinds of garbage sitting around uh, that essentially the stuff that's in here uh, was wasted space which has to do then with the worst case sort of big O estimate for uh, the overhead here is I uh, have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 units of memory more or less used uh, that were just garbage that didn't have anything to do with the uh, last final result that I ultimately produced. Similarly, you can see that the big O estimate for this thing belies the single loop here. Uh, that despite this iterating uh, some number of times associated with reps, and you'd say is you know big O n where n is reps or big O reps or something like that, actually each iteration did a non-constant amount of work. That this addition wasn't the kind of fixed digit addition you do in the CPU. That's instead string concatenation, and its operational complexity depends on how long the strings are. So over here, as I concatenated the first time, I needed to copy one character and then two characters and then three characters and then four characters and ultimately five characters. I similarly get a sum of five plus four plus three plus two plus one uh, units of work done to ultimately produce uh, this string. Now, as the sort of number of reps increases here, uh, then you get a further sur furtherance of that. And if you hadn't forgot the, a sequence that's like one plus two plus three plus four plus five uh, plus and so on up to plus n, this has a nice closed form solution. Uh, I think if I remember right, it's uh, like uh, n plus one uh, times n divided by two. Uh, it might be n minus one, I can remember. Uh, the point being that this is big O, uh, not of n, but of n squared. Uh, and uh, to that end, it's not constant. In fact, squares uh, quadratically as the size of the uh, sort of number of repetitions that you want increases. 
Uh, this is the kind of stuff that you cover in discrete math or by basic uh, sequences in series calc kinds of classes. Uh, and it's one of the most important identities that we have in computer science because it shows that this is a bad way uh, to do this particular kind of string building operation. Uh, so that raises the obvious question, what should I do instead? I mean, this is obvious and easy to code. For small sizes, it isn't bad, but for really big concatenations, it's going to waste memory and waste time. Uh, the answer to what should I do instead uh, comes next. Acquaint yourself with things like Java's string builder class uh, or array list classes. Uh, or equivalents in C++, for instance, the vector class, uh, which is meant to efficiently concatenate on. Those data structures uh, that are used there um, have a fixed sized array under the hood, but usually allocate some additional space, which gives an amortized cost to these append operations uh, so that you can, over many such appends, get an average complexity of O1 to tack on something. Uh, this is much more efficient for building large strings, and Java and many other programming languages have some built-in library uh, data types that are associated with string concatenation or um, tacking on to arrays that get you better than uh, quadratic complexity there. So to that end, explore those if you find those yourself in circumstances where uh, that would be the case. The reason we have to do this in Java is that there is no such built-in capability as string concatenation in C. And so as you would be making use of uh, sort of growing a string, you would obviously need to malloc longer arrays. And you would need to either call a string copy function, which would get your head scratching as to, well, what is this string copy function doing? What's its complexity? Uh, or manually copy the characters yourself, in which case you'd see this nested loop and find that it's quadratic in complexity. This is a good instance of a hidden cost that's induced by the program environment providing some conveniences, but those conveniences are not constant in terms of their cost. Uh, being aware of those and cognizant of them when they should be exploited uh, because you're only adding a few strings together versus using them in a loop and alternatives to that, this is the sign of a mature and competent programmer. All right. So we'll close today with a discussion of another micro-optimization, one that we have previously seen in our discussion of memory optimizations, but we'll revisit now and lend a little bit more formality to. This is the optimization known as loop unrolling. And generally, as you would go from the code over here, some range A, you see a loop with a single operation in it versus is over here is a form of unrolling, as in I'm gonna go by threes in this loop uh, and do three separate operations over here. There's also some additional um, sort of stuff that you need here that's mention of a second loop, but understanding what the purpose of this thing is is part of the exercise. And finally, we observed when we discussed memory that Brian O'Halloran in their discussion of memory access and efficient sort of visitation of it, uh, used a loop style that looks like this. Uh, now each of these changes a little something, and now's a good time to just contemplate why is it that you would go from here to here and ultimately arrive here? What is it that is expected to happen as you would make those transformations? Uh, because it looks kind of like copy-paste coding, uh, which you've hopefully been told not to do unless you really know what you're doing. In particular, which of these do you expect to go the fastest and why? Take a couple minutes, uh, think this over, and also answer the question, why is it that going from version A to B and C requires a second loop after the first one? Uh, get back to me in just a moment. All right, that should be long enough to pause and contemplate so the video and spoilers are ahead here. So this loop unrolling business uh, goes by threes. And the first question that I'll answer then is this uh, issue of another loop being present afterwards. Uh, this is, I think, made very apparent uh, in a loop that looks like this. If uh, my stop was something like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, 10, uh, which is not easily divisible by uh, the value here of three, uh, then what you find is that this um, first version will hit all of the elements in uh, the range of zero up to nine uh, and be just fine on that front. Uh, when getting to index 10, uh, then uh, we'll sort of miss something uh, there. Uh, so uh, to that end, when you go by threes instead though, uh, you'll need to stop somewhat prematurely for fear of going out of bounds. Uh, so uh, for uh, uh, a, an array that is of size 10, 
uh, then my stop value will be 10 here. Uh, and in the zero up case, I'll have I of zero, one, two, three, four, up to nine. And then when I get to 10, it's no longer less than stop, so I'll bail out and um, uh, stop here. Versus here, I'll start with an I of zero, but then be going by threes. So I'll have a zero and then a three, and then a six, uh, and a nine. And if I were just going less than 10, then I'd go up to 12 potentially. In this case, that works out, but all you need to do is go to 11, and you'll find that, oh, I'm starting to miss things here. So you'll notice that I've adjusted the loop boundary here to go down by 10, which is a premature stopping point. That prevents any out of bounds uh, sort of access and adding on elements uh, from this range or from arrays uh, that aren't as long as uh, sort of uh, if I took one more big step in this fashion. Uh, on the other hand, then, that means within the loop body itself, I have to adjust what I'm adding on so that here, if I'm going to get at I of 0, uh, add on 0, 1, and 2, uh, which is appropriate for these big steps, then I have to do a little bit of arithmetic uh, in the midst of this. And similarly, the second loop then has to be accounted for, uh, or sort of counts for the last few elements that might be uh, missed due to premature stopping up here. And again, this range is adjusted so I don't go over by that bounds and uh, sort of go out of bounds, as it were. Uh, so then in this second loop that shows up here and here accounts for the fact that I'm going by bigger steps uh, and need to stop a little bit early so as not to go out of bounds. Uh, and we'll get the last few elements. Generally, any benefit that I can expect uh, will be paid for uh, with this sort of additional complexity by the fact that these big steps in versions B and C, they handle the majority of the loop. Uh, so if I have an array of a million things, then most of the array is going to be hit uh, using this going by threes approach here. Uh, the final difference then be going uh, from uh, B version to C version is that I have broken up uh, the places that I'm summing into three separate memory locations. A sum 0, sum 1, sum 2, versus up here in this loop I have just a sum for each of these. Uh, while this simplifies the code after write later somewhat, uh, we noticed early on in our discussion of architecture, due to pipelining and superscalar effects, adding back to the same memory location every time can create hazards in the pipeline and interfere with the ability of the processor to effectively utilize all the hardware it has available. Versus using three separate spots of memory would very likely use three different memory locations uh, or three different registers. And that's very likely in this case because this is a tight loop. So registers A, B, and C get allocated for some zero, some one, some two. And each of these loop iterations then can uh, add on independently to those locations. Generally, reading a register, such as the register that would contain I, doesn't cost you anything and doesn't create any hazards, but writing to a spot uh, would. And you decrease the chance of hazards, increase the chance of effective pipelining and effectively using multiple ALUs by putting this in three separate registers. I arbitrarily selected the zeroth one uh, to be handled in the cleanup loop. And then I have one final operation, which is to add all three sums together uh, at the end here. Uh, very important because I've divided the sum I'm computing across those three variables, and it's the total that I need at the end of this. So generally due to architecture, uh, I can expect this last version to run the fastest. And this plays out uh, generally in most cases, although maybe not as effectively as you might think in some cases. Uh, so for instance, uh, if I turn on uh, debug level optimizations uh, and GCC this thing, uh, then I run it on a machine like uh, your Apollo, uh, which is uh, a machine that uh, we've used potentially in the past. Atlas is similar in that respect. Uh, seeing debug level optimizations on, on that front, uh, you'll see that the first range, uh, some range version, which doesn't have any loop unrolling, it goes uh, somewhat slower uh, than the other two versions. Uh, but interestingly, I didn't actually get much architectural benefits uh, from unrolling or uh, sort of uh, using these separate variables over here. Versus if I run this on my laptop, I see uh, somewhat different results. That it's actually some range A uh, does much better uh, than some range B, uh, and some range C is uh, somewhat better in performance there. Now, once I hear that, uh, the reasons for this have a lot to do with the internal processor that's used, uh, and so loop unrolling has a somewhat unpredictable characteristic to it. Uh, that the manual unrolling that we're doing. 
uh, it will vary in its efficacy between different machines and uh, you should expect that if you uh, plan to do hand unrolling that you'll want to tune your performance uh, specifically to one particular machine. And if you don't know what machine you're running on, it's probably not worth your time to do any manual unrolling. Uh, this is uh, going to be important for the project that it's very much expected you'll do some unrolling like this. And we have one specific machine, the Atlas machine, uh, that we're going to be running on there. And so tune what you're doing there uh, to that. Uh, keep in mind, too, that we unrolled three times here, and that wasn't special. You could alternatively have unrolled twice, where you're going by twos here, or unrolled four times, uh, in which case you've got a plus equal four and uh, operations within the loop body that are commensurate with that, along with cleanup afterwards that follows that suit. Knowing exactly how many times to unroll here is not obvious, and it usually is tied to the specific processor that you're working on, and we'll need to do some experimentation in order to figure out what's optimal. At some point, if you unroll, for instance, a ridiculous number of times, for instance, unroll 10 times, then you will have probably created more problems for yourself in that you need 10 registers to store the separate sums in here. Uh, and that puts a tremendous amount of register pressure on the compiler to figure out where am I going to find 10 registers to store each of these separately. Uh, at that point, the, the compiler may not be able to actually fulfill separate registers, and so it starts reusing them or using main memory locations uh, for the variables instead. All of that is going to hurt performance. And so generally, there are limits to how much uh, you can squeeze performance uh, using this unrolling technique. And it usually caps out at three or four unrolls, where on limited uh, register machines like Intel, where you only have 16 registers on the 64-bit platform, uh, at four unrolls, that is uh, hits the sort of maximum number of registers that you could use for a routine uh, and doesn't hit main memory, so it's a good place to stop. Going more than that creates register spill, where you have to use main memory locations, uh, and this hurts performance, being becoming counterproductive. So with all that in mind, then, uh, here is the take home in the wild on loop unrolling. Don't do it by hand. Instead, ask the compiler to do it for you. There is a series of F unroll loops uh, options that will have the compiler attempt to unroll at various levels and automatically determine, based on its register allocation algorithm, what's optimal uh, for that. And internally, then, the compiler will select, I unrolled twice and then ran out of registers, or I unrolled four times and ran out of registers, uh, and at that point, it'll sort of be efficient code. Uh, you won't be in that position for the um, project because we've disabled all the optimizations except the debug level ones. Uh, and to that end, you'll need to do hand unrolling. But in the wild, uh, this can convert code that would otherwise be uh, inefficient to become efficient. Example, uh, on Apollo, uh, we saw that the sum range A, which didn't have any loop unrolling, it did worse, uh, almost twice uh, the time, uh, about uh, one second total versus 0.6 seconds uh, for the sum range B and C versions. If you enable unrolling of loops here, you get much closer to the performance associated with those other two. And if you unroll loops and allow for another optimization that the compiler would oftentimes do uh, associated with unrolling, which is to expand variables, uh, then the compiler actually produces better code than our hand unrolled loops. Uh, this is because we made some strong statements in this code about where we want things to be put, made less so here, and as the compiler would unroll and then expand the use of variables here to, in a similar way to what we've done over here, uh, expand the number of places that are touched by, by memory, it can make better decisions uh, about this. All that, though, however, uh, pales in comparison to turning on uh, the other optimizations that a compiler can do. Uh, for instance, uh, the manual unrolls along with uh, allowing the compiler to do more aggressive optimizations uh, that are enabled with this O3 option. This gets even better performance yet on that front. So if you're in an application that you suspect loop unrolling would pay dividends, it probably makes more sense to turn on O3 and also turn on unrolling of loops. And this will very likely lead, along with a few other tweaks, uh, to better uh, performance overall without you having to actually do any hand unrolling. 
All right, we will leave off for there uh, with this important, uh, at least for the project uh, optimization. Students always seem to like unrolling because it gives them permission uh, to do this copy paste thing. Uh, but this is one of the very few instances in which uh, you can probably get away with it and have a good justification. In just about every other instance, uh, you'll see that copy pay, uh, pasting code uh, doesn't do you any good favors, and so you should avoid it uh, whenever possible. Uh, and loop unrolling in general doesn't have as much uh, sort of performance gains in many cases, except in this sort of numerical area that we're exploring in the project. So don't expect your uh, sort of binary search tree algorithm uh, that looks for things in binary search trees to benefit much from unrolling of loops. Uh, there are other things that are more important that you'll discuss in the project that have to do with searching binary trees uh, than the efficiency of the loops there. I'll leave off for now, and I hope everyone has started looking at the project. I look for a survey of what you'll be up against uh, to be posted soon. I'll see you guys again very soon.